On the Tape is presented by CME Group, where risk meets opportunity, and iConnections, reimagining how the investment industry connects. A warm welcome to the On the Tape podcast, Guy Adami, always joined by Danny Moses and Dan Nathan. Dan Nathan, how are you? I'm doing great, Guy. I mean, that's not a trick question. Danny Moses, how are you? I'm great and better Thank because you. of something else that has just occurred. Well, we have a great show coming up because starting with us today, you may have seen him recently on CNBC's Fast Money, live from South Beach. That would be the great Vincent Daniel. He's joining us. Literally walking down the street, up came up from the- Yeah, he came just, he was strolling around. In, yeah. And he said, why can't? So come on in. Pop-ins are always so the So we're going to talk to Vinny in a second. Then we have Cameron Dawson on the other side, on the B side, as they say. Yeah, right? That's correct. Which is going to be great. And you, Danny Moses, had a great conversation that's going to drop on Monday. By the way, Monday's a holiday. Why don't you tell us about that? Dan Nathan and I sat down with Bethany McLean, um, who obviously is a very highly regarded writer. Mm-hmm. Um, just wrote The Big Fail about mm-hmm. the COVID crisis. Smartest guys in the room. Um, all the other good stuff. And she's a contributing editor to uh, Vanity Fair and now a contributor to Business Insider. And we talked about everything. So I would definitely stay tuned for a special President's Day drop. And I just want the people to know that Danny Moses, who was mediocre most of the year in the league where they play for pay, got hot late. And you were the one that said you never bet against Mahomes. Yep. And you were spot on. Man, yep. man, oh, man. Nailed it. So yep. once again, congrats yeah, to you. thank you. Now, there was some news that broke today, today being Thursday, that the great Rod Stewart, Dan, sold his collection to Irving Azoff for $100 million. By the way, I think that's a little cheap, but hey, $100 million is $100 million, and I think he's pushing 80 years old. So congratulations to Rod Stewart. But the wheels in my mind start to turn and turn, and I'm a big, big Rod Stewart guy, and he covered a song back in the day with Jeff Beck, legendary guitarist. The name of the song from another great writer, this writer being Curtis Mayfield, was covered by many, many bands. But I think Rod Stewart and Jeff Beck's rendition of People Get Ready is haunting. So as Vinny sits to my left, I'm going to ask Vinny, what should people be getting ready for? Because there's some crazy shit going on, Vincent. First off, thanks for having me. Pleasure. Uh, Love being on the set. Uh, Thanks for the plug on CNBC Fast Money. You're amazing. First time, long time yeah. on that one. <laughs> um, so I don't really know how it we pulled it off, but we did. I think people have to get ready for volatility. And I've been saying this since the last time I was on here. And when you say people get ready for volatility, the first thing people think of is downside. Mm-hmm. I don't think that way, particularly if I could go long or short. I think volatility on the upside, volatility on the downside. And I'm going to throw out something that I try not to throw out. You know when you say, I don't want to use this Mm -hmm. all that much because very little was like this time period, right? But there's stuff in this market right now. I I thought you were going to go Prince on me. No, I'm not going going Prince. That would have been too easy, a little party. No, it's not not too easy because people say that that halftime show in the rain with Prince was – that's that's patently false. I was never a big Prince guy, but listen – that, that's not to cast aspersions. Nope. Just was never my cup of tea, but please continue. And I, lo- I love Prince. There are a little me differences too. between well, me and you. Okay, love them. There you go. Anyway. Okay. Not a fan. I, there are a few things we're seeing on the screen that are 99-esque. Now, I'm not saying we're in a bubble like 99. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying there are certain aspects of this market that are 99-esque. When I look at a chart like SMCI or Abercrombie & Fitch, mm-hmm. which is completely different, um, micro strategies i'm saying to myself wow something is going on here this feels very very odd to me and my only concern for people and i've told a few friends of mine saying guys this and this is weird just be prepared i don't know what's going on it feels odd so i the word people get ready for volatility Mm -hmm. it's coming you know the irony is that in march of 2000 it was the Nasdaq that eclipsed five thousand, mm-hmm. which proved to be right around the high. I think it went up like another fifty points after. This time we have the S and P. But the irony here is that the S and P is really structured like the old Nasdaq. When you think mm-hmm. about the two thousand, what's been carrying it? It's been tech. It's been thing. When you have like lack of price discovery on a continuous basis, and you're just buying momentum, and you're, you know, I've always said every day is a new underwriting opportunity. We know the momentum's there. But Dan's been talking about this also. There will be a time where these stocks retreat. They will fifty to sixty to seventy percent. 
What will be the trigger? I don't know. But it should scare the hell out of people from a volatility perspective. When a CPI print, which was, yeah, a little bit higher, and maybe somewhat expected, we had, we've had some strong job numbers as well, sends the S&P down 100 handles. We've now, of course, since recovered 80 of those 100 handles. And until that proves differently, until you have a compounding effect of continuous down, you know what? Have, have at it. It's a party. But I find it interesting, the timing here of, and actually the number 5,000. So. You know, it's interesting. So if you talk about the similarities between, like, let's say the ramp into the late 90s into the top in 2000, people are very, bulls are very quick to say, well, none of those, like I hear people say there were pre-revenue, there were no companies that were listed on the NASDAQ that didn't have revenue. Okay, I, let, let's be clear. So you're, you're automatically disqualified if that's how you start, because I hear that a lot, okay? So so the, the flip side of it, what's changed between the late 90s and now is the venture capital ecosystem, right? It didn't exist really meaningfully in the late 90s. So for companies to actually grow before they had profits, right, they had to get to the public markets, right, because they needed to raise capital and then they would use either their equity currency to buy other companies or they would take out debt and, and the like, you know what I mean? Like, so, so there's huge differences here, okay? So yes, there were a lot of unprofitable companies. What's going on here though is to me dangerous, to a word, okay, because the concentration is actually a lot more acute. It's concentrated among names that people think are safe. They were actually safe if rates went up, they're safe if rates go down, they're safe because they're gonna uh, address a, a, a addressable market that is gazillions, a trillion, you know what I mean? Like, so they've come up with all sorts of scenarios that make them feel good about it. And I'll just say this, okay, no one other than people like us back then thought this thing could come tumbling down the way it did. But it took years, okay? It took years. It took the NASDAQ 14 and a half years to get back to that nice 5,000 number. And yeah, we are at almost 16,000 or whatever. But like, so, so to me, you know, history may not repeat, but it certainly rhymes. And that's the focus I think that most investors should have. And the last point, my rant's gonna be over. Wow, that's a good one, over. by the way. No, but my, 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 my last point is we know this. Guy, how many years you been doing CBC's Fast Money? Uh, over 17. Now. How many thousands of personal investors have you interacted with, okay, who look at you and say, thank you. I know I've been there hundreds of times because a lot of individuals who are out there, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're truck drivers, they're whatever the heck they do. And they have their investments and they get caught up and they hear the FOMO, they do the exact opposite thing they should be doing. Danny, you say it all the time, you try to help people, but I just wanna throw it over to you because we know people make the worst possible decisions out of FOMO and then obviously out of despair. And we're seeing that now. And I'm gonna continue my line of questioning with our witness, our witness today being the great Vincent Daniel. <laughs> yes. uh, Vinny. Yes. I saw today, today being Thursday, that Japan, which was the third largest economy in the world for quite some time, is now number four behind Germany. But what is still number one is the United States of America, last I looked. And I only mention that because you mentioned volatility. Think about what we've seen in the bond market just this week. You know, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen 10-year yields go from 380. We traded up to 430. But we had a 20 basis point move this week in 10-year yields that for whatever reason people think is normal. There is nothing normal about that. So as I struggle to try to figure things out, I look at the bond market and say, this is the most liquid, largest security entity, whatever you want to call it, on the planet. It can't figure things out. So if the bond market is struggling, it's safe to say that a lot of other people who have complete certainty about things should be struggling as well. The only way, Guy, I can rationalize it in my head, right, is when I think about the structure of this economy. You guys talk about it a lot. I know I talk about it a lot. We are in a finance-based economy, yes. which is which, and they throw out these two words, fiscal dominance, which means we are highly, highly levered. And one of the reasons why we have a really good economy is because we're running six to eight fiscal deficits. My point being, when and sadly, they have levered the shit out of the treasury market as well. The incremental buyers of treasuries are doing it on a levered basis using a basis trade where they go long long the physical or short the futures and the like, and there's a spread there and they're levered 50 to 100 to one. So when I think about it that way, I'm not surprised you're seeing volatility because we're, it always feels like we're teetering on a resurgence, no landing, mm -hmm. or a hard landing. And the discrepancies between the two, because we're so levered, is material 
to the risk-free rate of return. If it's, if it's a hard landing, we might have, we might have the 10 year go to two, 3%. If it's a no landing, we're going to five and a half. So any incremental data points that come out, and if you're levered in treasuries and you own it, you can't be wrong now. It's very similar to, to the multi-managers. That is the way I justify the, the things that I'm seeing because the if then statements are so profound based upon where the economy is going. I think it's something in the middle to be God honest with you, but if you're taking an extreme view of it, I can understand why things are happening the way they're happening. So people should, people listening to this, I would imagine would want the volatility we're seeing in the bond market to somehow abate and rates sort of fall in, let's call it in terms of the 10 year yield, somewhere between 4% and 4.5%, just to throw it out there, right? But what if the opposite happens? Like what should people be alarmed by rates going significantly higher from here, which personally I think is going to happen, given the fact that there's almost $9 trillion of government paper that's rolling over and needs to be refinanced over the next 11 or so months? Or should they be concerned that rates plummet lower on the back of something else? Like, What should people be concerned about? It really depends upon where your portfolio is situated, right? Um, and, and what is your big risk? Uh, I worry about both because I think because we're so levered, I don't think we could handle either way. The easiest one we can handle, gun to head, is lower rates because I don't think this world works in a higher rate environment. Um, however, if we have a higher rate environment, we probably have reasonable employment, at least for the near term. So we've seen, I think part of this is just you want to be able to ignore rate volatility, market volatility, and just buy quality companies, you know, bottom up if you're long, long lane. To me, you've seen certain companies that, are, that have reported that are going to do well regardless of that situation. But when you start to see, you know, I call it F's and K's guy and everything in between. Well, right? what's in between? Like, whatever. You oh, can put whatever letters you want to put. That's a U. We got a C. eight K's. Yeah. You know, we got 13 F's. What are 13 F's? 13 F's are what you're required if you're a money manager managing over $100 million of external capital to report on a, on a lag basis your quarterly holdings. Mm -hmm. What happens last night? People, oh, Buffett sold some Apple. Yeah, he sold 10 million. He sells 905 million share. Okay, he shares. Musk erroneously reported, not him, not his fault. He did nothing. Actually, first time this he's innocent in all this of time. this. Is that he owns 20.5% of the company. That's up from 13. No, it's not. It's exact what it was. They just had included options, which by the way, he probably won't be getting. So if people reacting and trading, and what was the 8K that went off on Lyft's earnings, right? Selling an adjusted gross margin improvement of, 500 basis points instead of 50 in print. The machines take over and all this stuff. And I want to make a point. You can have machines and quants and all this. If there was a human sitting at that computer that had a brain on them that knew that, one, 500 basis points wasn't possible given the numbers that were right about right. it. You know, it's not possible. Too quickly that Tesla, which traded up in the aftermarket at that moment, right, or Apple, which trades down. And you actually put human behavior finance into this. This is the lost art. And so we are seeing the transition of not just FOMO, but computers chasing, which, by the way, and this is not a short or long call. This is an opportunistic call. And so I think we're at the precipice. I want to believe. I know where the stock picking has mattered now for the last two years on and off. But I think this is this type of situation where you can take advantage of. Right. And what Dan just talked about in the rant, I will say there are some differences. I'm going to, I'm going to compare one last thing. The companies that have been running on incrementally better numbers, some of those are big numbers, $3 billion, $4 billion and a quarter. OK, I get it. But I remember, and Vinny and I worked together. In 1999, going into 2000, and we specifically remember JDS Uniphase, which is the name, and the fiber optic business, Lucent and Nortel, and all, and to Dan's point, they were financing some of their own growth and going on. I think it was much more egregious than I think the debt levels were much worse. I'm not going to compare, but there was math that you could do if you took all the fiber that was being represented, that was going to be developed, that was going to be, you wrap around the world a hundred times, so you can figure out these CLEX and this stuff. I'm not saying that's what AI is here, but what I'm saying is that was a secular takeoff onto fiber optic, which proved to be real, and then it became cyclical. So at what point does this trade turn into, I'm not going to try to fight it. I'm not shorting any of those companies. And I'm not saying what I'm trying to do and we're trying to do is tell people don't FOMO here because you're at the craps table right now. You have the four, the five, the six, the eight, nine, 10. You're on the pass. You're on the come line and you're maxed odds on all. And a seven, which comes out six of every 36 rolls is freaking coming. Vinny. Here's the scary part. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> that's awesome, by the okay. way. Here's the scary part. About a week ago, I had a friend of mine, like you were mentioning, Dan, people calling up what they own. And he goes, Vinny, could you look at my portfolio? I'm like, oh God, here we go. Yes, I'll look at your portfolio. And he shows me the 15 names. And I guarantee you, you can nail 13 of the 15 names. It's not the names I own, but you got them. 
and we're talking about NVIDIA. And I say to him, he goes, Michael, what do you think of NVIDIA? And I say, it reminds me of Cisco. And you've seen the charts where they analog and all that other stuff. And he goes, great. <laughs> <laughs> That's the mentality of investors. So I agree with you, Danny. Don't try and shoot against this. Yep. Because it could go longer than you can ever dream of and higher than you can dream of. But also, please, don't buy them right here. Because, man, you could be down 30% in a day, right? Just because of rational, logical thinking. So please just try and stay away. I know it's hard. FOMO is a human it's a public trait. address announcement from Vincent Dale. No, and, it's the right and, and there are other things you can do and buy, right? right? You, you just please stay away from those crazies. So let's talk about that for a second because I think – the energy space, which I know you're passionate about, Danny, myself, Dan talks about it as well, that seems to be left by the wayside because of what's going on in technology. To a certain extent, this becomes zero sum. So if people can make 3 5% on a daily basis in these high-flying technology names, and it takes a month to make 3% in some of these energy names, it's obvious what people are going to do. But you know what I've thought for a while now is if there is a rotation out of technology it's going to find its way into energy. And I'll say again this week, over the weekend, we saw more M&A in the space and that M&A continues to pile up. So clearly something is going on there. Forgetting about the underlying commodity of crude oil, which has been between 75 and 80 seemingly forever, the fundamentals of the space are still absolutely intact. I don't want to forget about the price of crude oil for a second because I think what we have in the markets is – an incredible loosening of financial conditions. And if you look at the liquidity and the like, and Porter and I were talking about this the last few days, there's an odd, sneaky bid mm -hmm. to the price of oil. Forget about natty gas, that there, there's a weather issue and all that. The price of oil today was a great example. It started down today. It was down 1%, creep back up. And I've seen this the last four, five, six days. I think what oil is sniffing out that we have massive loosening of financial conditions, not just here, but also in China as well. And as a result, I, I'm not in the oils going to 100 to $120 camp. I'm more in the oil can stay between 80 and 90 mm -hmm. if this economy is okay. And if it does, I agree with you. Some of these names have been left for dead and there's some opportunities there. Not three to 5% per day or 15% per day, but definitely stuff that's on the cheap. And there's a big M&A wave going on. What name, to the extent that you want to or can speak to names that people know, like what's sort of on your radar? I mean, personally, and I've talked about this for a while, a name like Phillips 66 in this environment has done extraordinarily well. Marathon Petroleum, MPC, extraordinarily well. Valero, which nobody seemingly talks about, traded up to a multi-year high recently, north of $140. The ones that suck, in a word, continue to be the, big, the three big cap integrated names, Chevron, Conoco, and Exxon, for whatever reason. But is there something that sticks out to you in that space? One of our largest positions, we've talked about it before, is Petrobras, mm -hmm. uh, the Brazilian PBR. conglomerate. I was, I was speaking to a friend today, and they're like, do you do just small and micro caps? I go, no, I own a company that probably has top 10 largest revenues and top 10 net income in the world. It's a great like, beer, too, by the way. And, and, and what is it? I go, it's Petrobras, right? But I think there's other names out there, and we, we've been... Uh, combing around to look at them that are really great names and all of them have pristine balance sheets. Again, it's going to take some time, but... but So what do you think? Is it a is it a South America risk in general? Is it a Brazil risk, you know, in a, in a very finite, magnified way? Because this is a company that's performed recently, by the way. It's done extraordinarily well if you look at the last six months. But, you know, go back in history. I mean, this is a stock that probably made its all-time high sometime in 2008 or so, and not even remotely close to where we are now. So what's been, what do you think's been holding it back? What do people, what do you see that you don't think other people see? I think what we see is first off, if I think about the world, if we're going to do the trend of onshoring, a lot of it is going to come to South America and Latin America. So we start, we start with that dynamic. They also run a fiscal neutral situation. They also have a massive trade surplus. Uh, of the BRIC nations, no, they, we call them the Switzerland of the BRICs, <laughs> mainly because no one really starts a war with Brazil, nor do they want to. So everything's in good shape. And not, not only that, their real rates are, are crazy high. So they have an ability to lower rates in a material manner. So we take all of those things combined with the fact that Petrobras 
probably of the top four, top five major oil conglomerates have the best reserves out of almost all of them. And it's also the cheapest. And, and I think, and I think, Vinny, real quick, they think the report on March 7th. So folks listening to this have some time to take a look into their earnings release. And you've talked about this for a while. And I encourage people. I mean, this stock has done really well. And this is one that can probably surprise a lot of people to the upside. Yeah, I want to close that out and then shift gears with you, Vinny. But I would say that Buffett, in his 13F, what did he buy more of? Chevron. Mm -hmm. So he sold some Apple and bought Chevron. I'll close with that. So Vinny, bringing it back here to the States, and the thing that we talked about on CNBC a couple of weeks ago was Upstart Financial, just in general. And we saw what happened with Discover Financial and kind of the subprime consumer, the low-end consumer is certainly not in a, in a great place. And it's been somewhat masked by how strong service spending has been from the um, up, upper and middle income type type of consumer. So we are seeing this bifurcation take place. Now, some companies are appropriately reserved, some aren't. So, But I think we're at the beginning stages of really seeing kind of that, to, that type of deterioration. And I'll throw into that to get all in one thing, office and apartments and stuff. We're starting to see cracks kind of in all of it and rates staying high this long is starting to have an impact. What are your thoughts? I think your latter part is very important. Rates are staying higher. If higher for longer will be very bad for the real estate space because it, it's trying to breathe and it's trying to, you know, horrible to good or horrible to, to less bad. But if rates stay high, it's going to have a problem. On the credit side, there's a huge, I would say, intellectual tug of war with us fig geeks as to what's really happening. On the one hand, you have a company like Upstart, who's really a wholesale funded institution uh, that originates subprime loans. They can't get out of their way, right? But on the other hand, uh, who I think I always say is one of the best underwriters in the game, Capital One, thinks that credit costs are going to peak by 2Q, 24. And I trust what Richard says. I do. Uh, Fairbanks for those people. Richard out. Fairbanks. They're on our first name basis. I'm sorry. No, yeah. no, 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 I'm not. kidding. <laughs> Owner of the Washington Capitals, yeah, too. Exactly. But, but, um, he, I trust the CEO of what Capital One says, and he's not a liar. Discover's a little bit of a, a basket case because they have a regulatory issue and, and, and they've had a management issue. So what I think, I think we're having simple credit card default or, or consumer default normalization that looks like something worse than what it is. I'm not going out and saying it's going to get worse than normalization. All I'm saying is that if it's normalization, we're pretty close to the end. And that's why a lot of these stocks, while for every upstart that's down a lot, take a look at the charts, go on fact set, take a look at the charts. Of Capital One, American Express, they look great. Um, do I own them? No. Am I short them? No. But I'm telling you, they look great. American Express recently made an all-time high. It's fascinating. I'm going to shift gears on you. This is a curveball. We call this an Uncle Charlie in the business, but you are qualified to basically send this back the other way in a meaningful way. Gooden had the best curveball in 85. Continue. Sorry. He had a he had a very good curveball, but a guy like Burt Blylevin was ridiculous. So let's just put it out there. With all that said, in terms of commercial real estate, what I don't think a lot of people fully understand is the impact of the commercial real estate industry on the tax revenues of different cities. I mean, it's pretty it's pretty amazing. And I read something earlier this week, Boston, which you know typically I think tax revenues for a lot of these cities anywhere from five to fifteen percent, but I think thirty percent of their tax revenue comes from commercial real estate, and they're talking about a shortfall in tax revenue somewhere between one point two and one point five billion dollars over the next few years, which is significant. And I'm not asking you to trade municipal bonds at all. However, when I hear things like this, nobody seemingly is talking about the knock-on effects of the commercial real estate, which we all know, but what it could potentially do to some of these cities who are so levered to it. Thoughts on that? Uh, to me, it adds to a further question of no one's really talking about the fiscal deficit. And, and, and it's not just the fiscal deficit, but it's the municipal de deficits, as you said. This is a drag on revenues and, and eventually growth for, but we're not seeing it yet, to be fair. I think, I think uh, the federal is more than making up for anything we might potentially see in the near term. But in the longer term, I, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's going to be a material issue. And of course, that will impact construction and industrial and, and everything in the latter. Time will tell. Uh, I think it's one of the reasons why I think the powers that be are hell-bent to try and keep rates as low as humanly possible. Listen, it's having an impact. We just, you just talked about it. Boston. city of Boston is reliant on commercial real estate more than most other cities are because of the way they tax it versus 
residential. They're actually in the process of converting some office into condos, right? But that will come to lower tax. So the city of Boston now has to figure out how to deal with it. Job growth is great in Boston, unemployment's low in Boston, but these things have been such a big contributor, right? So we saw that article kind of today. So this goes back to tax receipts and how you can grow. And I think to your point, you have to raise taxes in order to, to get this money. It's not going to be about Janet Yellen only issuing $50 billion last year. That's all bullshit to me. That's smoke and mirror. So it doesn't matter now. People want to ignore it now, but it's going to matter. You know, it's interesting, Vinny, you just said something that the the powers that be hell bent on keeping rates as low as possible. I I mean, I guess that's the thing that the markets and all this volatility that we're talking about or lack thereof right now. It's just volatility to the upside in in a very, uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, well-defined sort of manner here. Um, Maybe that's the trick. Maybe it's like, okay, well, like we just got some employment data. We got some wage growth data. We just got some some, uh, you know, inflation data. As long as wage growth um, stays above inflation, as long as GDP doesn't, you know, I mean, like like there's there's some ways in which this maybe keeps chugging along a a little bit where rates don't have to go down meaningfully. And I just like put that out there a little bit. No, and I'm going to let Vinny answer. I'm going to say something real quick. Wage growth is actually not keeping up. As a matter of fact, government jobs, it's more than keeping up. In the private sector, it's lagging way behind. And I think this last print, for the first time in a while, I think we had a negative wage growth print. So I hear what you're saying, but people feel it right now. And inflation continues to be a problem. And the cumulative effect of inflation, everybody says inflation's going lower. No, it's not. Right, but it's the, going up slower than it but, was. But I guess, guy, I guess the point is, is if they're so quick to lower interest rates, they do that, and it makes the inflation problem that much worse. And, and I guess that's that's kind of my point. And what hasn't happened yet, there hasn't been a reckoning for risk asset prices yet about what higher for longer feels like. But and, you had it for one day, right? That's you right. Had, you had it for a little one bit day. of a tantrum. And let's talk about the the, I guess, event elephant in the room that is inevitable that's coming that no one's talking about yet, but maybe it's influencing a lot more things than we think, which is the election, right? There, there, there is, a, if you're in power right now and wanted to get reelected, you're going to do everything in your power to get reelected. And so as a result, are we starting, are we seeing this push for lower rates? Because they know what gets you elected, lower gas prices, jobs, higher stock market. And that's what we got. So to get back to your point, can this last? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, it can. I mean, we, we've seen a lot of crazy through our, our, our careers. And can it last another three, four months? You betcha. What, what I, do I like betting on it at these levels? No. It's not so easy. Okay, so I think back to you know the Trump administration, and Guy, you've used this expression on many occasions, that the guy that he put in place to run the Federal Reserve started you know like gradually raising interest rates, right? And as we got towards a slowing economy, as it got towards his reelection, he started, what, what was the term, browbeat, he you totally. know what I mean? He did, to lower interest rates. That's not so easy right here. There is no silver bullet for the, the situation that the economy faces right now, because if you were just to look the headline stuff, the stock market, where it is, inflation, where it is year over year, okay, and I get the number, is cumulative, right? Where unemployment is at record lows. If you look at even at wage growth, guy, if you don't want to parse it out, it's still above 4%. Like there's a whole host of things that signal that the economy's okay, that the markets are okay, and that should be good for the incumbent president, but it's not. So you tell me what the Biden administration should do about that. They put through a lot of legislation with the fiscal stuff that that is actually booing the economy. They were going to do that one way or another. So like my point is, I don't even think if you asked them, what would you do to keep this going into November 5th? I don't think they know. Well, you what you do is so what a few days ago, we had a hot CPI print. Yeah. The next day, there were two or three people poo-pooing from right. from from Austin Goolsby. Right, Goolsby. From Goolsby. And I think there was one or two others poo-pooing the data and saying, well, we don't look at CPI, we look at PCE, mm-hmm. right? They are trying to jawbone down to make sure, to me, my view, jawbone down to make sure we don't think higher for longer because higher for longer means a lower market. So I agree with you. They are a lot l- more limited now than they were before, but it doesn't mean they're not going to try. Uh, if it gets really bad, they're going to roll out yelling. And again, this is not me saying go out and go long markets. I'm just, I'm just thinking of the path dependencies of the paths that it can take as a result. And I have to respect the fact that they have to try and keep rates lower. They have to. 
uh, whether they're successful or not, we'll see. And the portfolio managers that are out there have to pay attention, no matter what their politics are. We we saw firsthand, you know, what happens to payday lenders. You know, with you know Trump got in house and CFPB gets, you know, taken down, right? And those are things that protect the consumer. So people have to pay attention to it. And to your point, have to start underwriting it and hedging it as the year goes on. So it'll be interesting how it plays out. But our sector, our old sector, financials, is the one that was always kind of front and center because the regulatory environment surrounding the banks and. There's another reason the Wall Street banks have been trading a little bit better, the belief that maybe the regulatory requirements will be pulled in, for better or for worse. But it's part of what I think the underwriting is going on right now. So, Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to the dulcet tones of Vincent Daniel, who will join <laughs> us again in the very near future, hopefully along with the great Porter Collins. They're sort of attached. Although you're not physically together, you are attached metaphorically at the hip, which I love about the both of you. Your relationship is inspiring to me. And we started this with people get ready. Well, Vinny told you what to get ready for. But the other side of the break, people get ready because Cameron Dawson will be joining us. So stick around. Welcome back to the On The Tape podcast. Still with Danny Moses. Still with Dan Nathan. G Swizz still here. But now we're joined by Cameron Dawson, who's the CIO of New Edge Wealth. She's been with us many times. Last appearance, I believe, towards the end of October. Cameron, how are you? I'm wonderful, thank you. It thank is you great to me. have you here. We're here, markets ripping yet again. I mean, I think when you came to us last time, the market was sort of, I don't want to say in the balls of its ass, but th things were struggling, <laughs> and we've been, had a rip-roaring rally since. So let's take it from there, and then we'll sort of get more granular. What do you think's going on over the last few weeks here? Well, I think clearly there's a momentum trade and a positioning chase. And if we looked at positioning metrics ending 2023, what you saw is that they were elevated but not extreme, which just told you that there was room for things to get sillier and that there was room for more money to be drawn into the market. And you throw on the fire of people saying, hey, the Fed's going to cut rates, so I got to get out of my cash a little bit, get invested. In result is that what you've seen is now you're about at 85th percentile in positioning. I think my favorite is the Deutsche Bank Consolidated Positioning Report, which suggests still more room to run, at least compared to prior peaks in positioning that were a problem for markets, like early 2018, right before Volmageddon, as well as at the beginning of 2022, of course, right before the 22 bear market. So that would suggest that maybe a little bit more room just for people to get pulled in. Nothing to do with fundamentals. If we look at earnings revisions, it's not about earnings going higher in the aggregate. Of course, there are select names where earnings are being revised significantly higher, but this is really all in the line of valuation, which tells you it's positioning chase and momentum, and it's the trend is your friend, and don't fight it until it gives you a darn good reason to. So how do you know when it ends? Because we've seen fits, like the other day, S&P down 100 points, right? And then you figure, okay, maybe this is going to be a healthy correction, and then two days later, we're pretty much right back where we were. So I'm not saying it validates a thesis or not, but from a behavioral finance perspective, you, you're wise beyond your years. You've seen cycles, but not as many as we have, but you know what to look for. So what is it? Is it going to be the next a two-day, a three-day that's going to convince people that, you know what, I'm leaving the craps table? We were all just down at iConnections a few weeks ago. And if you remember iConnections from 2022, that was the start of the 22 bear market. Really, it was it was during that time in February. And I was with friends who were traders in industrials and cyclicals, and names were gapping down 6 7% in just a day, very quickly, on no news. Nothing happened. People just de-risking positions, de-grossing their positions. I think if we get negative volatility alerts, that would certainly be an indication that more pain is to come. But one day isn't enough to break the trend, and I think that's that's why dip buyers have continued to step in. Of course, that needs some kind of catalyst, though. And I think it's a good exercise for us to discuss about what could that catalyst be for there to be a greater digestion than just one day and 1.3%. Yeah, I guess volatility happens on downside and on the upside. And Guy was pointing out earlier this week, the VIX was up on Monday and the market was up. Tuesday was actually the big kind of sell off in the market. So I think people mistake high vol or that for just on a down day, but you also have high vol and more risk every time the market goes up like it is, because to your point, who is, who's, sorry, who is the incremental buyer going to be at that point? And so that's the part that scares me is that when we do start to get that signal of a sell-off, what's the buy point on some of these names? 
Yeah, and I think that you also have to add on top of it all the dynamics around options because you've seen a ton of options activity where people are buying upside optionality with call options and paying up for that, but not having any demand for downside protection. Of course, in the very short term, that tends to feed on itself. Remember summer, late summer, early fall of 2021, where we had the gamma squeeze, where everybody was chasing into a lot of these tech names. It's probably not too far to think that there is going to be some kind of that gamma squeeze happening right now. Amy Wu Silverman from RBC was on Bloomberg this morning. She was discussing that point of that maybe you have this dynamic of buying because getting more buying, the challenge is, is it always ends a little bit ugly is because as soon as you have a catalyst to, to go in the opposite direction, a lot of things have to be unwound and unwound pretty quickly. You know, it's interesting, the point you make about the option stuff, and we've been highlighting it over the last few weeks and just looking at names like NVIDIA. So the premium that you would pay for the same percentage out of the money call versus put is dramatic, you know what I mean, for the call side. And then usually it's the opposite way, especially in a name like this that is appreciated so much, right, has become such a big part of an index. And so when I think about that, I say to myself, that has to correct itself because that's math. Do you understand? What I, you, don't, you, don't, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, but so, YOLO, come yeah, on. No, I, no, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but but like then that's why I think we can't put too fine a point on the expectations into Nvidia's earnings next week because obviously it's late cycle and the and it doesn't have to be a one day thing and you make a great point about Tuesday and that little tantrum that we saw um, to just slightly hotter than expected CPI data you know the funny thing is at some point in 2024. We're going to get to a point where the dollar strength, the yield strength in the 10-year commodity strength, right? Maybe inflation that has firmed up at least to the downside, you know, the downside prints that we're expecting. I think one of the things that got a lot of folks off sides heading into Tuesday morning in that CPI is that all the ex expectations were like, well, how much below 3% is it going to be? It wasn't even that much higher than expectations. That'll all happen when we least expect it. That'll all happen when the VIX is back towards, you know, these lows and, and, and people feel like everything's great. Nobody's going to be able to put their finger on that moment. So I'm just curious, you know, Cameron, when you were here, I think it was October 20th, you were fairly constructive on equities. Um, you just laid out a, a bunch of the reasons why people might consi you know, con continue to be constructive on it. But what would it be? You said something really interesting is that the estimate, you know, upward estimate revisions are not part of the bullish case right now. What if downside revisions, meaningfully ones, you know what I mean, happen to be the case? Because let's just say hypothetically NVIDIA not only doesn't guide up as much as people expect for the balance of the year, let's say they actually guide down. Yeah. Okay, then Like Cisco the, laying off people the, today. <laughs> well, that's right. But then that would mean the whole ecosystem. Okay, we started this week with Microsoft with the reviews for Copilot, right? This is the thing that they've been spending tens of billions of dollars in NVIDIA high-end GPUs to train these models and a large to, to, to put across all of their, you know, um, recurring revenue software services and this sort of, to get a higher margin and yada, yada. Like, that's how this starts. That's how it started in the year 2000. Yahoo one day put one too many banner ads on the internet and the whole thing came crashing down. So, you know, like, and no one could put their finger on when it was going to happen. And we should always remember that what has been the key driver of cap weighted upside to earnings estimates or the thing that has kept the S&P 500 earnings estimate relatively flat over the last six months has not just been tech. It's been very narrow. It's been semiconductors. And that makes a lot of sense, not just because of the whole AI trade and everybody in the arms race in order to have, have the tools needed to do that, but we also know that semiconductors were in a general downturn. We looked at things like industrial and auto and all of the inventory overhangs. So it makes sense that we are in an upswing, but remember that's probably the most cyclical industry in the world. So if you're going to bet your life on semiconductors being the one true savior. And remember when everybody's saying that semiconductors weren't cyclical back during the Internet of Things boom when we were putting chips and everything? They said, oh, no, it's not going to be cyclical anymore because there's going to be so much demand. It's a cyclical industry. It's a very high capital intensity industry. So what I'd say is that we have to be very cognizant of second derivative slowdowns and growth, mostly for those cyclical sectors. 
I will, though, counter on myself where I'm trying to play devil's advocate is I say, look, I think PMIs are actually rebounding. Whether that's real or not, and it leads to better industrial activity, we've been in a negative PMI or not negative, sub 50 PMI contractionary for over 12 months. They look to be turning. That second derivative is turning positive. And part of that could be certain pockets of inventory starting to, to, to be rebuilt or the fact that it's just year over year dynamics. Typically, there's a high correlation between PMIs and S&P 500 revenue growth. So with that, I think that we have to be able to have the potential to believe that maybe there is a scenario where a cyclical recovery in the U.S. economy leads to certain pockets of upside in earnings. But I would say that it has to happen. Earnings breadth has to broaden out for this market to continue on anything that would be fundamental versus the air of just positioning chases. So if the market's strength is predicated upon what the Fed's going to do or not do, and you're saying, and I can't disagree with that, that maybe PMI is improving, there's no Fed rate cuts coming under that scenario. So how do you play the market in a way that is so financialized as an economy and the consumer at some point is going to get affected by these higher rates for longer? We've now gone from seven to five in the market in terms of rate cuts this year, right? Even though the Fed's still saying three. So how do you factor that in? Because the offset of that strength would be Fed going zero. So here's a fun fact. Last week, I looked at when the Fed was cutting rates each and every cycle since the early 90s. Never have they ever cut rates when PMIs were accelerating. They might have started cutting rates. So they might have cut rates, continued to cut rates after PMIs had bottomed. Every single time they cut rates, including the non-recessionary times, 95, 98, 2019, PMIs were falling. And it's one of the reasons why they were cutting rates. They were worried about a recession. There was some kind of fear of a recession implied in the rate cuts, not just financial stability like we had in 2019 or in 1998. So I would say is that if the Fed actually cuts rates this year, and let's say it's May or June is now it's been pushed out and we have an accelerating PMI, it would be the one time, the first time ever that they have done that in the modern era. This teased me up perfectly for my question. Uh, I watch do you th these Grammy Awards. You watch these yeah, things? You're a big award show guy. Yeah. Well, I don't understand. You deserve an award. I do. I appreciate that. Cable I'm, facts, maybe. I'm still trying to figure, maybe one of our listeners or viewers can help me. I, I don't understand the difference between record of the year and album of the year. Yeah, no one knows. No one knows. Yeah. I, I think the people at the Grammys have no idea. Yeah. Isn't record a single song? Yes. Uh, no. There's also song of the year. So, I mean, thank you for that. I think because there the is writer the is year. the record. and the Song is the writer no, and record is the no, performer. No, whatever. Again, again. The whole thing whatever. is Fugazi. Go ahead. But what wasn't Fugazi. You have Google in front of you. I do. And it doesn't well, know I'll, You know what? I'm going to do that. Please. On the, on the, on the Google <laughs> Gemini Advance. Billy yeah. Joel. Performed yeah. there. First time in like, for, first new song he's written yeah, in like he probably 30 shouldn't years. have done that. Probably shouldn't have done that. Fair enough. But Cameron wrote a great note over the weekend, didn't she? she and did. the title of the note was, not we didn't start the fire. She titled it, we didn't stop the fire. And it's got that Neil Cash Carey sort of dialogue going. So all the things you just mentioned about PMIs, I think lends itself to that note you had out and sort of the cross currents of the economy and Fed policy. Speak to that. So Neil Kashkari put out an essay, effectively questioned whether or not the Fed had anything to do with the disinflation that we've seen over the last 18 months and whether or not policy could be judged as tight, given the fact that growth has been so resilient. To the first question, he answers and saying, look, we probably didn't have much to do with oil prices falling, but we probably had something to do with stabilization of inflation expectations. That's a fair point. If the Fed had done nothing, inflation expectations would have likely run away and the, the inflation episode would have been that much worse. To the second point, is policy tight? I think it's really interesting that if you look at that piece of data that the Fed has been using a lot, which is, hey, over the last six months, core PCE is at or below our target, which means that over the last six months, that 2% percent min uh, min coming from the Fed funds rate means that Fed funds, real Fed funds is technically very tight. 
over the last six months, this economy has grown significantly above trend. Now, we could have a debate as to whether or not that data is accurate, if it's capturing whatever's going on under the surface, but there's enough things to point to to say that that current stance of monetary policy isn't grinding this economy to a halt. And we think the key reason why that's happening is that this economy is much less levered to the short-term interest rates and is much more levered to longer-term interest rates, meaning it doesn't have to refinance as frequently because of the decade and a half of quantitative easing that this, that this tightening cycle has come after. Just to put a point on it is that if you look at net interest expense using the Bureau of Economic Analysis data, it is down 36% in the last tick, which means that net interest expense over the course of 2023 fell. Overall, aggregate corporations earned more on their cash than they saw their interest payments go up because they had longer term debt, but they had big cash balances coming out of the pandemic and all of that. End result is that it's the only time that that has happened in any other prior hiking cycle. Usually, Fed hikes, corporations see their interest expense go up because they have commercial paper, they have short term borrowing, they have bank lines. This is in aggregate, I would say. It's not everybody. There are people, companies uh, that do have trouble borrowing and are feeling the pinch from higher interest rates. However, in aggregate, this economy, I think you could argue, and this is heretical, but you could argue that on net, at least for these large companies or what's being captured in the BEA data, that rate hikes, at least in 2023, have been stimulative. You bring up a great point, And we often talk about great CEOs, not Silicon Valley Bank. I mean, you just brought up a point where they weren't prepared for what had occurred. Different, whole different type of thing. But still, you want to own the companies that are unaffected you know, by all the macro and they're focusing on their micro. So from a sector allocation perspective, it's not about being bearish. It's about not wanting to chase some of these high value tech names. Where would you go right now? Because it seems like there's a lot of opportunity on the long side. It just may not be in the stuff that everyone else is focusing on. Here's the challenge. The stuff that everybody's focused on is the only area that's seeing EPS revisions higher. So I just got back from another conference, the ETF exchange conference. And if I were to make one observation about a consensus call from that conference, it was you got to diversify out of the Magnificent Seven. Indices are too concentrated. And it raises the question, I don't know the answer, this might be wrong, but I think we should raise the question is if the pain trade is actually that what has been working keeps on working. Is that the thing that would cause the greatest degree of pain for this market? Because we know that markets love pain. Love, max pain. Max pain. Max pain. And so until we see earnings revisions broaden out, I don't know if you can see the overall uh, uh, S&P 500 broaden out to the extent that people are calling for. Now, we do like other sectors. We are overweight healthcare, for example, because healthcare, though it's still seeing negative earnings revisions, earnings growth overall is flipping from being down 13% last year to being, or down 30% last year to being up 13% this year. So you're getting a big delta, which should help from a second derivative basis. It's cheap. It's somewhat defensive. So that is an area where we're finding opportunity. But I think that if we're picking individual names, a lot of it comes down to where do we think we can get positive earnings revisions? All right. So if 2022 was discounting the earnings recession that we had in 2023 for the S&P 500, here we are in 2024. The S&P is already up five and a half percent. We know the expectation is for, let's say, 10 percent EPS growth. Now, listen, if the mag, whatever you want to call them, if they can continue to outperform and there are positive earnings revisions, that would actually be, I think at this stage of the game, probably good for all those other sectors that have been lagging. And therefore, you could probably justify that 10% number. That being said, okay, if there's any downtick in, in that, it doesn't matter where we might see like an uptick in energy or this and that or whatever, because they won't, they won't make up all of the weight, right? Like, so it's kind of like, I don't know, we either get a lot more concentrated, the market gets that much more expensive, the, the concentration in a small group of names gets that much more severe, or we start having negative earnings revisions. And then what does the stock market do in that scenario? Does it care about 10% expected earnings growth, maybe going to mid single digits? Boy, you're gonna carry that weight, mm. right? Like that, that well, is- throwing a little Beatles at your ass. That's beautiful. Continue. I, th I mean, that is the tech sector is it does carry the weight. And I think it's good to remember the 
delta between energy performance and tech performance over the course of 2022 was, I think, over 60%. So energy did great because oil prices were higher and had you know, big earnings growth. Tech did terribly. In result was that the mar- overall market went down, but energy had a great time. So I think to your point is that this market needs tech to continue to be able to outperform because now it's at an all-time high weight in the index. So tech still has to be able to chug along. But to your next point or to your first question about what are we discounting over the course of 24, it will be 2025 earnings. And if there is any inkling that a recession could be more likely in 2025, you will start seeing those earnings estimates get cut, and that's when you could have an actual correction. Because remember, 2022, as you said, was all about the earnings recession in 23. So you were pricing in the earnings recession because you were revising earnings down lower and lower. And then as you went through the course of 23, 23 earnings estimates didn't change all year long, even though GDP continued to surprise to the upside. So I'd say is that keep your head on a swivel because if 25 estimates were to be cut, you're going to price it in probably starting at the latest in mid-24. You speak Gaidami. I mean, I mean I like it's somebody. absolutely amazing. I just like, want to make one point. It's ESP. I know. I right. just want to make one point about just how irrational certain things in the market have gotten. Okay, so again, so NVIDIA's earnings are next Wednesday. The implied move in the options market is $80 in either direction. So, well, and, and that's not even the crazy thing. So the stock is at $730, okay? So it's a little more than a 10% implied move. So if I look at next week's weekly options in NVIDIA, if you were to look at $80 to the upside, okay, those would cost you about $17 or $17.5. If I were to look $80 to the downside for a put. $9.5, that's a guess. You're right. Yeah. That's think a, about that two to one the, skew. I mean, the, I didn't for even- For the record, he's not even looking at No, I'm not looking at that, it, but I know the math. It's crazy. All right. You should be a bookie. Okay. Well, but that's it. Nine sixty five guy, Dom. Yeah. Like, no, no, it's that, insane. No. So, Cameron, do you understand what, what we're saying? Is like, so everybody is on one side of this trade, and so just to broaden that out, I mean, like, like, like you know, I, I just want to make that. But Dan, before she answers that, so part of that is fund managers that don't own it, that can't afford to keep missing it, that decide to waste some premium, the uh, chance to just participate. To a degree. So you probably have professional money managers in there as well. It's not just retail people there, because that's also what's been going on. I talked about this a couple weeks ago. The higher the market cap, the more self fulfilling it is that you cannot miss it. So as they go up in market cap, it becomes an even bigger FOMO, but not for retail, for the professional money managers, right? Well, it just speaks to how. There are signs of liquidity froth in this market. It's more than just that two to one skew. It is also what's going on with things like SNCI. Tommy Thornton put out a great chart this morning that showed on Twitter, he showed how 57% of the performance of the Russell 2000 is coming from that one stock alone. Then you have things like crypto rallying. All of these things are a function of liquidity. We know that they have been related to liquidity in the past. And I think it probably shouldn't be lost on us that bank reserves are at a new all-time high. And what happened in 2022 to bank reserves? They declined pretty materially. So this is still an abundant liquidity environment for markets, despite the fact of what the Fed's doing. And I, if I look back on last year, you the, the the reality is that the Fed really didn't matter for markets because the Fed was much tighter than markets were expecting throughout the course of the year. It didn't matter for valuations. What mattered for valuations was, of course, optimism about growth pricing and that earnings recovery, as well as liquidity dynamics. And that's why you started to see liquidity sensitive parts of the market do well. IPOs, ARC, all of those things that we know have been tied at the hip to liquidity. It's still happening today. And I think that, that that's a, it's, it, all of these things are all interconnected and they're all probably one trade. So if the trade breaks, they all break. You just made a really good point. And I stare at my fact set machine all day, every day. Um, and you just said about super micro. Okay. So the, the Russell 2000, if you just look at the IWM, the ETF that tracks it, um, super micro is 2%. Okay. It's a basically an equal weight sort of ETF. Okay. But because it's up 250% this year alone, and it's $55 billion, that is an accident waiting to happen in, in, in an index that has performed very poorly on a relative basis. So like, there's stuff under the hood, guy, 
that actually is kind of dangerous. If that stock were to come down to earth, interest rates were to stay high, there was some sort of issue in uh, regional banking sector or CRE stuff or whatever, like, like the IWM, the Russell's dead. But you look at like what happened with NVIDIA last year in May. We're almost anniversary in that, by the way, in the May quarter, whatever that quarter was. And it was a three or four billion dollar beat in, in revenue. They correct? went from eight. Okay. Bill, they went from a seven point eight billion dollars to eleven billion dollars. Right, and guide. then people extrapolated, and then they became they kind of got more confidence because the next quarter, whatever. Supermicro, same thing. I believe they guided up. I want to say three or four billion, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, Dan. So it's following this pattern, but I think more so it speaks to the machines that are following the pattern. It speaks to what's the new thing? Dividend growth. Oh, all of a sudden on the dividend, most companies that pay a dividend and they're substantial. They're not big growers. Because there's a reason that they're paying out cash. They have Showers. nothing better to do with it, which is great. A sign of a healthy company. I think it's a great way to invest. But Cameron, we talked about with Vinny in the first half of this episode about how these 13Fs and 8Ks and all these things that you know computers are trying to simulate all this information and make decisions on. It feels like being a human at this point is going to pay more. At some point, it will matter a lot more than trying to figure out what these machines are doing. And it just takes patience takes duration and maybe it takes a big wallet to stay there and do these things and again it's not about being bearish it's not this is about being practical and things that we've seen in our careers well remember i think it was 2016 when everybody fell in love with low volatility like the min vol strategies and then they all unwound i think in 2017 it's somewhere around that time where min vol ended up becoming high volatility because they got to be such crowded trades and it's one of the things you know, we we are quality buyers uh that's how we manage all of our equity strategies but the overlay that we put on everything is that it's quality at a reasonable valuation. Usually we'll trade at around you know 20% discount to the underlying to the underlying indices that we're benchmarking against because the biggest risk is that you get these crowded trades and everybody owns the same thing because it works. So that's an answer to that question. As far as as winners and losers, I think Vinny is very right because when the tide goes out, it's the Warren Buffett, you know, you see who's swimming without their shorts on. And what we typically see late cycle is a greater divergence between those that win and those that lose. And you start seeing the men and the boys get separated. It's early cycle when the light rising tide lifts all boats. And I can make a lot of arguments as to why we're not early cycle, that we are more late cycle. We could argue when the cycle will actually end. But that selectivity is so very important because the tide will eventually go out. You're seeing, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about it. I think you're starting to sow the seeds of the next credit cycle right now. You got headlines today in private credit about how the spread that you're getting over your index rate is starting to compress and compress and compress because private credit rates so much capital. The banks are now going, wait, 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 we want this business too. They're going in and bidding on deals. And so they're giving up price. And when that starts to happen, you're starting to see the activities of less prudent credit and lending, which eventually creates the scenario for bigger credit cycles to start. You talk about credit in general. We see, we can talk about commercial real estate, office properties, apartments, right? We're seeing the financing. So there's been a lot of extensions which have been given, but now it's here. The wall of refinance is here. It's in various pockets. It's in certain banks. It's in certain companies. Arbor Realty, as people listen to this, will have just reported. And you're starting to see, obviously, those type of delinquencies shoot up massively year over year in the Sun Belt, in apartment complexes, on loans that have been given out. So when does that start to matter? Because it reminds me a lot of the mortgage crisis to a degree of kind of the, some of the smaller companies which were holding the bag. But eventually, there's just no way it doesn't creep back into kind of the, this is really the non-bank financial system, doesn't creep back to the financial system. Maybe, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. What are your thoughts? The refinancing really starts to kick in in the fourth quarter of this year and starting 2025. And that's going to be the key challenge, which is that a lot of companies who are looking to refinance are looking at the Fed and saying, oh, but the Fed's going to cut interest rates. It's going to be great. I'll be bailed out. Everything will be fine. And my question to them would be, since when do you fund on the overnight rate? Uh, because if long and yields stay elevated you're going to continue to have, you're going to see a meaningful uptick in your interest expense. So I think that the fact that we we really increase our refinancing needs in 2025, not just for real estate, but for high yield across the board. Remember, you had a great refinancing in 20 and 2021 at 
ultra low rates. The 10 year hit 0.5% in June of 2021, or sorry, June of 2020. So you had massive amounts of refinancing, which is now going to start coming due in 25 and 26. That's your credit cycle. To the question about contagion in the economy, it's really interesting that if you look at office real estate construction expenses, they're actually still at all time highs because it's so lagging. And they were at all time highs in the prior cycle until mid 2008, which means that you know the wheels had already completely fallen off, but you're gonna finish projects. What you're starting to see is that growth rate is starting to slow down. So the second derivative is slowing down, which would suggest that as you go into 25, there is a chance that the slowdown in commercial real estate could have an actual impact on the broader economy. But the reason it hasn't yet is because construction's still at all time highs, so people are still employed, so construction employment's all at all time highs. It's the perfect example of how data lags. Cameron uh, brought up the great Abbey Road album when she answered a question that Dan <laughs> asked. And for the record, I looked at his computer, he had to look up which album it was. No, so. no, no, oh, <laughs> that's not outed. true. What I was, what I was looking up though was, a lot of people think the album ends with the song in the end, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make, which is not true, because their last song on that album is a 23-second song called Her Majesty, and your performances, not only here with us, but on CNBC, Cameron Dawson, are majestic, so thank you for joining us yet again. That's very kind. What a great way to go out. Oh, my goodness. I don't know what to say, other than you probably should get a screen shield, so I can't snoop. I know what that is. (laughs) Thanks, Cameron. Thank you so much.